right, welcome everyone to another episode of Thought Crimes, the podcast where no topics are off limits. If you or I or Jason were able to learn even one thing today, then I think uh, we've accomplished our mission. So before we begin, Jason, what is new with you? Hello there, my friend. Um, it was one heck of a week, man. Uh, last week, uh, last week's episode, I, I mentioned how I'm pulling double duty at work with my role and another role. And that is continuing for uh, for the past week, and it's probably going to continue for a good little while. So right now, I'm I'm learning how to uh, manage an entire department, very short staffed, but uh, it's going well. We're we're having fun with it. I'm learning a lot. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I got in yesterday, and I was completely brain dead. Like I tried to do a little bit of research for this, and if you if you had a pair of glasses that you could look into my brain. It essentially looked like a TV that you turned to a channel with static. It was just <laughs> nothing was going on. So, so, so same old for you. Same old, same old. There's <laughs> nothing, no, no sign of life to be found. But uh, yeah, I'm enjoying the challenge. It's, it's honestly, it's going quite well. And uh, I'm looking forward to see how, how it's going to go. How about you, man? Right What's new with you? Uh, not much really. Um, we're, uh, it's, we're expecting a really nice weekend here. So looking forward to the sun, uh, get rid of that, you know, February depression. And, uh, other than that, yeah, we're back into zone red. So that's fun. Hey, uh, today, uh, to get rid of the, uh, winter blues, today's the first day of spring. The, uh, the equinox was this morning. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. 20th today. There you go. Right on. Um, so we have a special, um, special guest for today's podcast. Uh, and uh, I guess you can accuse me of nepotism, but the guest is my sister, <laughs> Emily. Uh, and Emily uh, is also kind of a part of the, the, the Thought Crimes podcast team here and uh, helps us uh, quite a bit with our social media presence. So without fur- further ado, Emily, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What's uh what's new in your in your world? Well, as you said, we're uh we're living the great restricted life here. So uh my days are filled with binge watching Survivor and and reading lots of books and pretty much every day is the same. So Yeah, so just for the audience, um if you think you're a little I don't know, obsessive with something, uh just know that my sister Emily and her boyfriend uh have decided to rewatch Every single season of Survivor yes. that's ever existed, and that is the only thing they watch on TV at this moment. I that... will never challenge you to tr- Survivor trivia. <laughs> We're up to season thirty-two now. Uh, there you go. This and is, 40 I think right it's now, been right? eight months of us watching. We're on season thirty-two. There you go. There's a total of forty seasons, right? Yeah, we're very committed at this point. So, like, if if you were dropped onto a survivor what would be your strats because you, you must have like mastered the mental game by this point we ask each other all the time like do you think you'd actually be good on survivor and i think socially i'd have a decent game but i think the lack of sleep would absolutely destroy me and therefore i don't think i'd be very good at survivor to be honest um but strategy you know be likable is key at first i think i think you'd be pretty good at puzzles I would be good at the puzzle challenges, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I really do think that the the terrible sleep quality would ruin. Yeah. Me. I th- I think one thing we all take for granted. Some little who needs sleep. Yeah. I think I'd have a hard time with sleep too. I'm not a big sleeper, but uh, the the one thing I feel like we all take for granted when we watch Survivor or used to is that you're always kind of like, oh, I could I could do that challenge. Like, what's their problem? And and you forget that some of them have been there starving for 20 days or 30 days. And they, you know, they've barely slept. They've been in the sun or rain all day, every day. And they've had like a half a cup of rice. Oh, yeah. They, um, Jeff, dear Jeff, the host, um, at one of the finales yeah, a few Jeff, seasons. Jeff ago. is my sister's crush. Yes. <laughs> Has been since I was like 12. Um, uh, he showed how much rice they, they eat in a day if they ration it out correctly. And it's it, stupid small. It's like 100 calories that they get. For the yeah, day. well, like, on, what is it on average? People lose like twenty to forty pounds. Yeah, like, all depends on the person, the of, but by the end of the forty days, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. So, like, is there like I'm trying to think the social dynamics? Like, it's just t- like take your typical season, not like a, a winners challenge or, or something like that. Do you always tend to see like 
one person take the lead, one person kind of being a bit of the schemer, a few people being likable and like the, the tribes fracturing into like different little enclaves, that sort of thing. So the, the more the seasons go along, there are more and more schemers. Because in the first few seasons, that doesn't really seem to be as much of a, a strategy. People don't, aren't aware of how snaky they can be. Um, but there's definitely always one person that, that becomes the leader, whether they want to or not. Um, there's often someone who's like, I'm a great leader. And then people are just so annoyed by them and they get voted out. Yeah, um, yeah the, the, the best leaders are like the ones that... Actually, some of the best well, leaders... Well, just the I've natural ones. Natural slash like do it so well that they're almost cult like like uh you see <laughs> oh, like, what's his name coach oh yes is that his name? and then uh boston rob uh yes. does that actually Always. both seasons i saw him and he was really really good at uh basically controlling he had the all the young girls following him yeah, yeah exactly look like rob's cult uh all right so uh Without further ado, we'll we'll get started with. Uh, I mean, I could do, I could do this whole episode about Survivor, but I was gonna say I guess. we'll have you back and we could talk about uh, Survivor. <laughs> uh, Survivor was uh, Emily and I's family show as well. It's what we watched every Thursday night with the family, without exception. So Emily's been rewatching. When I say rewatching, it's truly rewatching. She's uh, seen some seasons probably three times. <laughs> some of them, yeah, but a lot of them you can't remember exactly what happens. You know, they all kind of blend yeah. together. Yeah. I would so, love to watch them from like a, a red pill social dynamics and kind of like now that we're older and adults and we, we, we understand that aspect a little bit better, really kind of seeing the, the workings of it. And I, I think that could make for, a, I feel like we could crush a pool at this point. You know, Emily would have the, the, the home court advantage, but uh, I feel like the red pill knowledge would, would come in pretty handy there. Well, that's yeah. why Survivor stayed relevant is that it's, Every season is a social experiment and it's a microcosm it of society. So that's why it's that's why it yeah. stays relevant. Sometimes sometimes the tribes split up right away in like boys versus girls. And then sometimes it's like one guy like Boston Rob is like totally alpha male and, and takes control of the entire game. Sometimes it's yeah. Sometimes it's you have couple. like a guy saying, I really have to almost coach Ashley because she's really naive and then Ashley gives a confessional she's like this guy's so condescending I would never tolerate this in my real life but he needs to think I'm stupid <laughs> and then they vote him out <laughs> yeah exactly good um, stuff so we'll, we're gonna right before we delve into today's main topic we're going to uh continue on the segment that we started a few weeks ago called canceled Finish him. so what will be canceled next uh, so Emily, you have the privilege of joining us today. Yes, uh, so, I thought long so and hard. We'll, yeah, there you go. So we'll start with Jason, and then uh, and then Emily. I want to hear what you think will be canceled. So Jason, what will be canceled in the near future? Man, the way you set that one up, I thought you were going to put Emily to go first. I was like, sweet, <laughs> I don't have to go first on this one. Uh, all right, here's one. I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet, or maybe it has, and I just completely missed it because something's getting canceled every other day. Uh, it's hard to keep up. I get it. Anything referring to normal, regular, or normalcy. Because what that implies is that there is something that is an average, there is something that is normal, and there are things that are abnormal. And with social relativism, mm -hmm. they're one of their big underpinnings is that there's no such thing as normal because anything that exists is normal simply by virtue of existing. So I'm thinking any time that we're going to have like, uh, say, normal intelligence, normal behavior, uh, normal thought processes, normal social conventions, anything that re re refers to normal or regular will be canceled because it'll be ex uh, exclusive or supremacy or, you know, pick your favorite Easter ism to yeah. put on top of it. Jason, what about the government telling us to get used to the new normal? Oh, don't even get me started on that one. <laughs> Is that one acceptable? Yeah. Well, it's canceled in a way. Technically, they take the normal and they make it into something. <laughs> new. So, yeah, technically, uh, he's not wrong there. Uh, yeah. So you're talking about more of the, the critical theories that come out of uh, France. Uh, mainly, I think it's in the 60s. This it, it started. Um, so a lot of basically like not even just questioning, but completely criticizing uh, or, or refuting the fact that there are truths that we believe in to have a somewhat cohesive and progressive society. Right. And it's also a very sneaky way to undermine anything that has a, a conservative stance. 
is anything conservative is going to want to protect old thoughts, old customs, old habits, all, all these olds. And if you're not allowed to have a normal, you're not allowed to protect anything that's existed for X amount of time. Indeed. All right. I like how you went uh, more uh, broad uh, catch all here. All right, Emily, what is canceled next? Mine, Mine's also a pretty broad topic. I don't, just to clarify, I don't think this will be fully canceled, but I will not be surprised if there's some sort of awareness campaign about country music because uh-huh. it features mostly white people, a lot of them men who sing yes, about women true. and God and, and traditional beer. values. Man, and, I, trucks, and trucks are bad for the environment. That's true. <laughs> Dirt rows and short shorts and man, you can make like a country song bingo card and you'd get bingo every single time. Yeah. To be <laughs> it's fair, like, oh short shorts, I got bingo. <laughs> to be fair, that's country pop or pop country, whatever you want to call it. And there's some good there's some good country pop, but I also really like like country. There's some really good, well written country, just saying. But yeah. <laughs> but I think it will come to light that, you know, either either country music needs to change to be more inclusive. Mm-hmm. Or, I don't know, there's, it'll, it'll be a thing. But that, okay. like that, um, that music tends to cater to the segment of people that are more freedom loving, more on their own, more independent. So I think you need to go a couple more steps down the, the crazy rabbit hole before you can attack like your last bastion of freedom loving people <laughs> outright like that. Because that's, that's when the pitchforks and the shotguns come out, right? Yeah. But I, yeah, I don't know how far we are from from a total. I mean, they they've attacked. Uh, you you have like some mainstream outlets and and journalists who've attacked classical music. What? Why? They, yeah, yeah. That Beethoven has been. They're, they're trying to cancel Beethoven. I'll, I'll have to find you the the articles and the push for this. But uh, Beethoven is you know whiteness, and that's the whole thing now. It's is uh, is let's make everything into whiteness, which used to be you know worse words. But what we've done is we've just umbrella it out so that it's no longer Nazis, it's no longer neo-Nazis, it's no longer white supremacy. Now it's whiteness. And that that to them equates to all the same thing. It's just bad and it it's all cancelable. So uh yeah, I think country music's probably a realistic one. Yeah, probably like six weeks away. <laughs> I love her putting a timeline <laughs> yeah, on each of these. Yeah, let's let's start a <laughs> countdown for all of the ones we uh we suggest. Okay, mine is and it's funny that Emily brought this up because I actually had written it down a few weeks ago. So I, I, when I think of things, I just write it down on my phone so that I have a repository of them. Uh, and it's actually Survivor. <laughs> no. Yeah. Never cancel it. <laughs> what will she do? Jeff will live to... forever as the host. Well, Emily, this is fact. It's coming. <laughs> I've I, seen they, it. they canceled the uh, Bachelor host, though, because it's like, yeah. mm, maybe we shouldn't uh, you know, demonize a girl for going to a frat party. Yeah, not even that you're basically like i don't i haven't talked to her yet uh maybe we can wait <laughs> till i talk to her <laughs> how about we give, yeah basically it was basically like how about we be respectful of the situation and give everybody their due process was pretty much what he was trying to say and then they're like yeah you're never coming on the show again and he's like i've been in the show for the entire lifespan of this show uh, the the host sorry wait so you don't think survivor will be canceled because of my man jeff probes though no not because of jeff okay. no 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 I think it will be um, because, because well, first of all, you said it's social experiment. So yes, I think there's uh, sometimes, you know, there's toxic masculinity, that kind of stuff. So uh, not, not something to be seen on TV. Uh, I also think the whole, uh, the whole fact that they go somewhere and then they basically, uh, you know, participate in, in that place's culture. I think is uh, very easy to cancel nowadays. So it's it's cultural appropriation whenever they use. Uh, Honestly, they do that band. less and less because they just yep. they only film in Fiji now because for the show's budget, it was just way more doable to, to stay in one location and, and do two seasons at a time. And a lot of I'm part of the Survivor subreddit, and uh, a major complaint that people have for is sure. they miss the culture being, you know, yeah, a part of the show. Yeah, but I see what but you're I- saying. Why? Well, because I've rewatched a few seasons too with with my wife. And Where they I'm like, like stab the the cow and they have to drink the cow blood. Yeah, yeah, that's a Africa. good one. Yeah, it is some fresh blood. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's that's my pick for for this week. <laughs> I hope you're wrong. Um, I hope so too, <laughs> but I'm right about a lot of stuff. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, 
So today's topic is, or question is, is university worth it? And so uh, we thought we'd uh, we'd bring Emily along for this one because Emily is uh, a high school teacher. So oh, yeah. she she's uh, she's got good insights on what what our uh, prospects are looking like today, but also um, you know can give us more of a guidance counselor perspective because uh, she works with with high school students who are about to join the labor market or the or university or college or whatever it may be. So that is uh, that is today's big question: Is university worth it? But before we start, maybe really quickly, uh, the three of us can uh, tell the audience what what our <clears throat> educational backgrounds are. Sure, well, go so, ahead. Go ahead, Will. You start. Sure. Uh, so real quick, I have a bachelor's in uh, arts, technically, with a specialization in history and a minor in uh, in French and lettres françaises. So actual French, guys, not French as a second language. Uh, I feel like when I'm talking to Anglophones, there's a it's always like, oh, French. Like, no, no, it's like yeah. French as a first language. French is French. our first language. All three Correct. of us. Just yeah. to clarify. Exactly. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> what else? I have also a teaching degree. I just like Emily, so I, uh, I have a B.Ed. as well, and uh, and I've worked, I've worked, uh, I've actually been a, I guess you could call it a practicing historian. I've I've worked as a as an oral historian and both and as an assistant curator for a uh, a, a national museum. So that's my my background uh, of, of post secondary education. What about you, Jason? Man, I'm going to be salty this episode. I'm going to be real <laughs> tough on university. It's going to be fun. So my education, don't do what I did. All right, kids, not a good idea. (laughs) So So, Jason's not biased at all with the question we're asking today. (laughs) thousand percent not biased. Um, All right. So I did a bachelor's degree in kinesiology. So that's exercise science. The idea with that, ah, I'm not even going to bother defending. uh, And then I did. Just real quick. Yeah, 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 just real quick. After the BSc. I did a, a master's of health science research. So I did an epidemiological study. I published a, a research paper and uh, got a, a proper statistics-based MSc degree. And then after that, I decided research was boring. and I didn't want to do a PhD. So I got a, an MBA instead. Okay, MBA. Cool. So I, so I got a one degree and two master's. So weird that you're going to be hard on university when you spent, you know, 57 years at it. Exactly. And I think that's why I'm the most qualified to be super salty about this episode. Yeah. yeah for the audience who don't know Jason, he's actually uh, he's actually 47 years old <laughs> in school. For... And that's really yeah. impressive that I spent 57 years in university only being 47. None yeah. of us studied math, Jason. <laughs> Leave us alone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah numbers are hard. I'll just go study yeah. Let Francaise instead. Yeah, So exactly. that, that brings us to me, <laughs> who... Uh, did a major in Lettre Française. So um, very similarly to Will, I did a, an honors bachelor degree in arts with a major in Lettre Française. So it's, it's a French degree. You study everything from literature to editing to grammar and creative writing. Um, and I did a minor in English. Similarly, English was literature and writing and all those things. Um, Lots of cancellations happening in English. So. Yes, tell me about it. And then with that, I, I wanted to become a teacher. So I went into uh, a Bachelor of Education. And now I teach both French and English at the high school level. Yeah. Cool. Right on. So uh, as you can see, we're all uh, heavily, I, I guess we heavily uh, tilt towards university, not in terms of what, what, what our opinion is today, but in terms of our background and, and the time and money we have spent on our educations or, or uh, training. So we're going to start with the general fors and against that we've identified. So uh, again, always using the question, is university worth it? So in this context, what are the positives or the net benefits that we see from university? And then what are the net negatives uh, that we see of, of uh, going to university? Or, or, uh, or what works best if you don't go to university? Uh, and after that, we're going we're gonna to finish off with some, some general questions that I have for you guys. Uh, and, and we'll just you know, have some open discussions on that. So uh, to begin, for what what are reasons why you should go to university? Or Emily, if you're talking to a uh, to a kid, right, to a student, and he's uh, in grade eleven or twelve, I don't know, he's got good marks, he likes school, he wants to keep going to school, maybe. 
why should you say yes, go to university? Uh, well, I'd say the most straightforward one is depending on if they have a specific job in mind, some require a university degree. <laughs> True. Like uh, nursing. Yeah. You know, teaching. Uh, like you, medicine, medicine. Yeah, for exactly. some, it's just the clear path. That's what is required. Right. Right. Okay. So yeah, employability, right? It, yeah. It, you have to go to university for certain, uh, for certain jobs or, or vocations or, or skills. Um, another one too, I would say is anyone, although this is slightly changing or very much changing because of COVID times, but I, I wrote down social experience, right? It is oh, a, for sure. it is typically if you go on campus, you live the campus life. It's the first time for a lot of students that they're away from home for any good amount of time. Uh, it, it really, well, and hopefully teaches them to be adults, to be their own and, uh, to start managing their entire life along with their class load and, and maybe a side job, whatever it may be. But, but that entire life and experience, um, allows some to, to really, you know, figure out who they are and become adults. Uh, however, I said it's changing because of COVID times. I mean, most well, people many are aren't now getting that, that experience. This They're year. not getting a campus yeah. life experience at all. Uh, they're even, even a class experience. A lot of them are not getting a class experience there. Every student that I'm talking to university student is kind of hating their experience right now. They, they hate the virtual classes. They don't find that the profs should be getting paid this much for, for virtual classes. Yeah, and or that, that there's no reduction in their fees and stuff. Yeah. All this stuff. So. Uh, so the experience has definitely gone down, but for the sake of the argument, I, I will keep it. I mean, that's how universities have worked for uh, for centuries now. So yeah, and and the social ex- like living on campus. I mean, I feel so bad for for recent high school grads who who might not get to experience it at least for a couple of years. Because I mean, I remember right dropping you off on campus, and I was going. I was in grade nine. I guess gr- going into grade ten, and uh, I was just like, campus is the coolest thing I've ever seen. It's like a it's like a city for just mm-hmm. young people <laughs> yeah yeah it's a little city and uh there. i spent the yeah. next three years just anxiously awaiting my turn and it was awesome when i got there so. yeah yeah it, it is a it is absolutely a very cool experience and uh, i was dropped off when i was 17 right and lived on my own since yeah. uh so it, it, it definitely it's an opportunity for you to live a whole new life and a whole adult life um yeah jason anything you want to add i I contributed absolutely nothing to this segment, so I'm just going to read one of the the uh, the four since it's one that I took part of quite a bit in university. That was the extracurriculars. Um, I did track and field throughout all of my my university experience, which I very much enjoyed. Uh, learned quite a bit. Got an excellent physical shape. Uh, you know, was able to travel, compete, meet a lot of people, all that good stuff. Uh, developed a, a very very strong work ethic uh, around training and understanding, you know, you, you learn from your failures, you learn from your successes, all that sort of thing, which was good. Um, so I guess the soft skills I gained from it from were, were quite nice. But once we get to the, the, the cons, I'll, I'll have a few things to contribute there too. Sounds good. Well, yeah, did you do uh, extracurriculars in uni? <clears throat> I mean, not many. Not I, organized, the, I don't think. For the most part, I worked quite a bit. Um, so as of basically at end of year one, I, I started working and I always had a job, at least one job. Uh, so that, so that was really my big extracurricular. Other than that, I played a bit of volleyball. Oh, right. Um, you did intramural. I, yeah. I, I was doing that in, in high school. And actually the, the big thing I would say it, it is great. I had a buddy, you know, I made, I made friends with two guys on my floor in first year. Uh, they were part of the their high school football team. We're from a small town in New Brunswick. Football doesn't exist. I always wanted to play football, but I was just didn't exist in my region. And I was also a stick. So when uh, when we got to first year and I made friends with these guys, we would actually work out together. And that's really where I started more of my workout love for working out and ethic. And I've I've been working out ever since. For the I last thought year. I thought you were going to say you were the ball. <laughs> they just kicked him. <laughs> they just I'm kicked too- him around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, anyways, that's that's uh, anything else for four. I, I see Emily. You wrote down that uh, it, it does give you the opportunity to also study and explore different topics that you wouldn't otherwise. Get yeah, just I was thinking also, especially for you know, as you said, we're from a small town, and our high school was quite small and had very few electives, just because there were not enough students to to build a class. Like I know. 
in high school. I, I signed up every year in the survey to take poli sci. It was never offered because I was probably one of two students who, who wrote down they wanted to take it. And, you know, when, once I got to university, yeah. I actually got to take who a political science class. cares about things like civics, right? And how <laughs> elections work. <laughs> so, well, see, in Ontario, civics is a mandatory class, which I yeah. think is great. But, uh, yeah, so it just gave, gave me the opportunity, at least in my program, where I, I had electives, because it was an arts program, uh, to, to explore a few subjects that I'd never had the opportunity to, to study before. Like music in the movies. <laughs> Okay, did I contribute to society by taking that class? No, but it was an enjoyable class. I bet. I, I heard, I remember hearing a bunch of good things about that class. Hey, uh, another time we should do an episode on like, what should high school look like? Like what courses should be included in high school? And that'd be a great discussion between you two since you're both uh, trained teachers. For yeah. sure. And, and it's actually something, it's something I'd like to finish on today. So we could definitely delve into it. Uh, further in a full episode, but I definitely want to talk about what high school should look like to prepare us better for for real life, whether that's university or not. <clears throat> in fact, I'd push for more classes that don't have to do with university prep. Uh, so against what Here, are here's so, your time so to talk, shine, Jason. Yeah, so we talked about what is for what what are the what are the good arguments to go uh, to university? What are the bad ones? Why shouldn't you go to university, Jason? Stupidly expensive. You're saddling yourself with a bunch of debt for most likely learning how to say, would you like fries with that? Like, <laughs> that's pretty much what you're, you're getting yourself. Oh, look at me. I have $40,000 in student loans. Okay, would you like a venti or a grande? Like, that, that's pretty much what you're getting in most cases, right? And, and just a, a sidebar here. This is a Canadian perspective. If you're American, it is likely much more. Uh, Canadian universities are still somewhat affordable compared to certain places like the U.S. Uh, and by the way, when we talk about university uh, in America, that would be college. Uh, and right. then college here community would be college. more of a community or skills college. So, so university equal the, you know, like, the, the big colleges in, in the U.S. Yeah. So since I, I spent two years in a research master's degree, published a scientific paper and all that, I used my finest Googling skills to find out percentages of people with student loans. And uh, so in, this is the most recent Stats Canada figures. Uh, they come from 2015. And if we only look at uh, premier six, so people with uh, bachelor's degrees, upon graduation, 54% of Canadian students with a bachelor's degree have student loans. That's more than half. Uh, it's not as bad as I thought, though. Yeah, I would assume this would be even higher in the States just because yes. it's of the more expensive, but yeah. yeah exactly. Right. And it, when you look at the tuitions, like some provinces are, are much lower, like Quebec, the university is quite affordable, really. Uh, Ontario, quite a bit less. BC, quite a bit less. But I would it, also argue that Quebec actually has a better system to prep people for with uh, life. Or yeah, for just life yeah. after high school because they have specialized high school, which is called CIGEP. Yeah, no, that's a, a very good system. That's when we get into like our, our high school discussion, that could be something to, to bring up. For sure. So the percentage of graduates with more than twenty five thousand dollars in debt is forty five percent. So, and that's not forty five percent of the fifty four percent. That's oh wow, forty five percent of all students. So that means the vast majority of students who have debt have more than twenty five thousand dollars worth of debt. Wow. Uh, the average debt upon graduation is 28000 Now, that sounds low-ish, but when you take the average time of repayment, the average repayment time in Canada of student loans is 10 years. So you think, let's say you graduate at, I don't know, 24 years old. Well, between 24 and 34, that's the time where you're most likely buying your first home. It's, that's probably your first or second car. Uh, you might be looking to get married. You might be looking at starting a family. But if you're only clearing your debts by the time you're 34 years old, you're putting a, a big anchor on all those other far more important steps that you'll most likely want to take down the road. Yeah, it's crazy. Eh? For the for the duration of your bachelor's degree, you're most likely not making money. You're you're getting indebted, and then you spent so you lose those four years, and then the next ten, you're still you're still paying back that time. And then, like, say you finish paying it off, well, you might want to enjoy yourself a little bit because you're finally not saddled with that burden, right? 
So if you're if you're the type, kind of person who's not very financially astute, you might go right back into debt because you're like, yeah, I'm debt free. Let's go on a trip. And then you, you take off to Europe for a month and you're $5,000 in debt again. So you're no better off than you were. Right. I think, too, it's, it is important to uh, highlight, though, that this is a an average statistic. Right. Uh, and, and that there are there are <clears throat> degrees you take at university that pretty much guarantee you an income. Um, but that the issue here is that over the past decades, we've been seeing more and more folks going to university simply because they think they should go to university. And when they do get to university, they take uh, degrees or classes that do not essentially do not promise them or prepare them for a specific skill, job, employment. Um, you know, the, the difference between getting super indebted for med school, but knowing that the second you get out, you got a residency and then, and then you're a doctor and you can calculate exactly, you know, in a couple of years or not even, I will be paying back my insane amount of debt. However, this is my salary and it's a, it's a pretty strong one. Therefore I can easily justify why I'm, I'm going to be a doctor over the next 10 years. Right. Right. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later when we get to the, the next segment but essentially, I looked at uh, the graduation of a, of a small university and just using my, my own discernation, I, uh, I categorize them in bullshit and good degrees. And... That's the Jason pisses everyone off segment. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, Emily, is, is, Emily, is there anything you want to uh, talk about for the against category? Uh, I mean, I do think the uh, you, you touched on it a little bit. Well, Will said just... Will just said the opposite, actually, about, you know, some degrees, you're almost guaranteed a job. But on the opposite, a degree doesn't guarantee you a job, right? A lot of people are just like, oh, I, I'll go, I'll get a degree. And it's like, okay, well, unless you have a plan for that degree, sometimes you're just four years later, $50,000 in debt, and still hard to get a job because, you know, your degree was some vague, you know, not that useful topic. Yeah. You and, and it's, and it's a trend that's been increasing. Yeah. I think that's mostly due to the, the trend in the last, I'm going to say a couple decades of, you know, follow your passion, follow your interest as opposed to come up with a practical plan. Or, or this is because in the fifties and sixties, a lot more like this is what we need yeah. in the society. But there, again, there was a lot more of that cohesion in that kind of social contract you would make with your, your country, your region, or even, even your town. And it was like, I, I, we need more, you know, uh, mill workers, or we need, uh, if I'm going to university, cause I, I know I can, and I want to, you know, we need this type of engineer. Okay, cool. Like that's what I will prepare for. And it's not something it, it's like the university system has gotten so big and almost detached from reality that it's not about being able to supply the market. It, it, it has nothing to do with the free market anymore. And that's kind of what I want to touch on is the supply and demand aspect. Whereas before, the reason any degree was a good degree, say in the 50s, 60s, and maybe borderline the 80s, is because the supply of people with degrees was so low and the demand was high enough. Now you have such an overwhelming supply of people with degrees, or as, when we say degrees, we mean bachelor's degrees mostly also that the bachelor degree essentially becomes the new high school degree and the master's degree becomes a new bachelor's degree as getting to the point where mo like a master's degree is almost relevant, especially if it's something like, like a sociology master's degree or some like an MA of some sort, then you're most likely no more skilled or no more employable than you were. And you're probably even less employable because from a, an employer standpoint, they're going to see that and think the person is going to expect a salary well above what the value they can bring to the corporation. Yeah. Another good example of a kind of a more applicable career is occupational therapy or physiotherapy. And that's something that I, I, I still do not comprehend. It, those, those degrees used to be bachelor degrees. So if you wanted to become an occupational therapist, for instance, you would go do your four years and you would specialize that bachelor made you be a practical occupational therapist. Now it's, I can do it in general science or, or, or physio or w w kinetic science, whatever they call the, the general bachelors now, any kind of thing like that. And then you apply to have to do a master's now, and that master's will then specialize in occupational therapy. Um, they do that with physio, all, all the 
all the kind of, you know, small uh, pockets of specializations uh, within healthcare. However, I don't see how nursing has still is still a very practical four year degree where you work very hard at truly practicing being a nurse. Uh, and that hasn't changed. However, things like occupational therapy now require a master's. Yeah. Similarly, social um, social work used to be a, a college degree. Now it's uh, a four-year undergrad degree at university. Uh, you know, does that mean that the social workers we have now are and, you know, and I think better Emily, and smarter? <laughs> I think, Emily, up. you're touching on a really important point here, is that most degrees have a lot of fluff added to them just to pad them out to four-year degrees. So like the example of the of the social worker yeah. might be that um, you have, let, let's say you have 120 uh, credits worth. So that'd be 40 courses through your, your four years. So that's five per semester, 10 classes per year. Um, out of your 120 credits, you might only have 40 to 50 credits of actual hard social work. The rest will be philosophy, sociology, English, maybe some statistics, a bunch of electives. So you're only spending maybe a year and a half to two years really working on um, on the uh, on the actual core concepts of your degree. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a, an example I can attest to is Will did the um, Bachelor of Education when it was a one year program. So you do a, a full undergrad and then it's a one year additional program. So he just had eight months. He had two semesters of this teacher's college and uh I, by the time I graduated, it was a two-year program, so it was double the time, and uh, I can honestly say at least, well, half those classes did not need to exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I don't want to drag too long on this section. Like, we'll, like we, we can kind of pepper in arguments as we go along, but there's one thing, Emily, you touched on earlier that I think is, is really important, especially for a younger audience to understand, that it's one of those... It's very seductive, but it's it's a trap to fall into. You mentioned when you and your, your parents dropped William off at university, you got to see the campus and it was essentially the, a, a city for young people. And, and that is true, especially where Will, William went to U Ottawa. It's a beautiful area. It's enclosed. It's in proximity to a whole bunch of amenities. Yeah, it's, right in downtown. It's fun. It's a great location. Anytime that I went to visit Will when he was in university, we had, you know, legendary weekends, but, but uh, Q Barney Simpson or Samson or yeah. whatever, the, the one from, uh, wait for it, <laughs> yeah, wait for it, oh, man, what a way to not end a show. But uh, anyways, so Emily, like you're 14 at the time when you, when you get to see this and your old, older brother goes off to university and you think, wow, this is cool. All right. That's what I want to do. So essentially in that moment at 14 years old, being you know, very impressionable, your mind was like 80% made up that that's the way I'm going to go. Especially that you're a smart kid, you got good grades, like most likely you're going to go that direction anyways. And she and she admires her big brother, so. <laughs> well, that, that's what, her fault. So I, I will say you're, you're not wrong about how, you know, it sold me even more, but I will clarify that my I became a teacher and literally since grade three, I've been like, yes, oh, yeah. I will become a teacher. So okay. I can't say that just dropping my brother off at university was made me decide I really want to go to university. It was just always what I was planning yeah, to Emily's do. Emily's actually one of, one of those teachers who always wanted to be a teacher. Yeah, cool. I'm, that, I'm that cute story. So uh, the, the point I want to bring with that is that, that that social construct of like campus life is fake. It's not a real place. It's, it's propped up by subsidies. It's, it's a fake environment that is very pleasurable for a young person. But the moment that you exit it, you are not prepared for real life because it is not similar to the to to what you're going to experience as a true functioning adult. Sure. Oh, yeah. As However, much as I said, cool, it's a city for young people. Is that the best kind of city to be in where there's just people like you your age? You know, <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. Right. And yeah. then I, I think of someone who, you know, I think of one of my, my dear friends who's a plumber who, you know, did his year of, of, uh, of study and then started his, his apprenticeship. Well, he was thrown in right to the deep end with a bunch of adults and there, there was no handholding, there was no pity. And he went straight to work and learned, which is a far more applicable atmosphere than the kind of 
yay, look at this fun atmosphere of four years for, for you know, for, for people on so, campus. Yeah. So the argument could be the four is uh, it's fun and it's got a great campus life for a while. However, the against of that part is that it doesn't prepare you or it is not, uh, ac- it does not accurately um, represent real, real life. Exactly. All right. So the, the last bit I'd mentioned before we move uh, to the next section is indoctrination. I think that's a, that's a against, uh, as I think we're seeing this happening more and more, is that the minds of young adults and teenagers are now being influenced heavily by specific narratives that are taught at universities. And now this indoctrination, this kind of wokeness has uh, permeated not only uh, into the humanities and the arts and the social sciences, they're now getting into hard sciences, which, you know, years ago, people were making fun of them, like, "Ah, whatever, they'll never make it to the sciences, all this stuff. And now, uh, you know, math is racist. So um, it's not only that they're in the universities are now indoctrinating. It's that they're, it's that they're they're preparing our kids even less now with true skills on how the real world works. Like if you start deconstructing math and telling me two plus two doesn't equal four, and that that math is a a because now math is a sign of whiteness, right? Um, which is funny because math is Arabic uh, in many respects. That's where a lot of math and the basis of, of a lot of math theories were were invented. Yeah, algorithms, algebra, like anything that starts with yeah. al is Arabic. Zero, the word zero is Arabic, like all of these things. And it's just like, can you do a bit of research? And and ironically, you know, it's uh, not also what they teach in history um, or or it's now taught by people who pretend they know history. But anyways, uh, so all of that stuff not only brainwashes you it also doesn't teach you what math is anymore so i mean the day they tell us that four plus four or two plus two doesn't equal four we will literally be in 1984 correct (laughs) what's funny if you ask a math major like does two plus two equal four they'll say no because like the concept of two doesn't exist because they get like a perfect entier's like next to impossible, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so I, I remember that my, my first year university fully enjoying the campus experience, sitting in a lounge with a math major. I was like, dude, you know math too much. Two plus two is four. Okay. Okay. Here's a better example then, Jason. Uh, how about you don't apply gravity? <laughs> no, you can't. You can't disprove the theory of gravity to me right now. Try jumping off a building and tell me how that works out, right? <laughs> I think that's a pretty good reality. That's a good reality. Until you disprove that to me. You should so add you a disclaimer. Like we don't encourage people to actually go and jump off of buildings. <laughs> yeah. You never know today. Okay. So moving on. So those were the fours and against. Now, just before we get to our, our kind of last discussion segment, uh, Jason, you prepared a few, uh, a very biased study or, or analysis, I guess, on your alma mater. So it's a small, fairly small university. And basically uh, you looked at 194 undergrad programs and uh, you divide, you categorize them. So can you tell us about that? I, I call it the JDI, the Jason Degree Index. So go for it. So it's my much sciencey, very science, much statistically significant uh, study of d- dividing degrees between bullshit and actually useful. So okay. this is where um, you offend so- every listener we have. Yeah, including ourselves, because all of our degrees are bullshit. Yes, I opened the document (laughs) and was slightly offended when I read it. (laughs) Good, good. That's what you want. You want to piss people off so they don't make the same mistakes you did. So what is your, um, what categorizes something as bullshit? What what does that mean for you? It's the return on investment. So it's how much the opportunity cost of the time that you're going to spend acquiring the, the degree the obviously the the, the cost the, the monetary cost of it the opportunity cost of just going to work or the opportunity cost of studying something that would have been more fruitful long term and also okay. the societal cost of let's say you're unemployable and you have to go on, on the dole or welfare or ei or some other support socialist program like that that you're pulling tax revenue away from people who are actually productive in society so I did, I just kind of did it off the top of my head. Didn't run any numbers. Yeah, it seems legit. 
<laughs> super legit nothing to critique here but basically i just went through like all the th- faculties and i looked at all the different programs and i was like this one's bullshit this one makes sense so if you look at the and their numbers didn't even add up they they say that there's 194 programs but when you like uh add them all up there's 185 somehow so right there, the university can't do math. Or maybe Jason can't do math. I don't know. <laughs> maybe they have concurrent programs or something. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. So real quick, uh, if you look at all the programs, 111 of them are bullshit and 80 of them are good. I'll just I'll specify, s- Jason added, arts and admin are all the bullshit ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, out of the 111 bullshit programs, 89 of them so like you know 85 percent are from the arts and the admin faculty out of the 80 good programs 46 so you know like more than half like 55 percent of them are from the sciences and the engineering programs Uh, let me give you some some examples of bullshit here let's go with uh administration so there's 34 admin programs 24 of which are, are bullshit so some examples of that marketing management, general admin studies. What in the world's general admin? That, and, and my favorite here is international management. Hi company, I have a degree in international management. Please send me to Fiji so I can go manage internationally. Which I, and I have zero days of experience. Yeah, uh, exactly. I, that, I always find that kind of funny though, when there's like management or project management, that kind of stuff. And of course, it's always kind of like the chicken or the egg, right? But when there's bachelor degrees on on very kind of managerial perspective things, I, I always find it funny because I'm just like, that to me is more of a skills thing. It's it's more of like a, you work for a certain amount of years and then like your employer can make you a manager yeah, or you work decide to, into to get you a bit of practical management training or experience on the job. To me, it's not a like, here's four years on uh, for a 19 year old on how to be a manager. Yeah, exactly. And, and just like drop that now 23 year old into uh, a corporation with a bunch of people who are in their 30s, 40s, who have 10 plus years of experience, who actually know the trade, know the environment. And now all of a sudden you're their boss. How's that going right. to go? Right. So there's a couple of good ones. Accounting. That makes sense. You can be an accountant. You'll get your CPA. Finance generally makes sense. Get your CFA and you can crunch some numbers. Supply chain, very good. It's one of those that it's kind of strange, but I think like one of the big employers in uh, in New Brunswick here is Irving. They run supply chains left and right. They're v- completely vertically integrated. You need to have supply chain managers. So surprisingly good degree. And the last one is the JD MBA. I was generous on this one, but most likely if you have a law slash MBA, you're probably going to be employed and and well-employed. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but one that's fun to pick on is arts. And we got a couple, you know, arts and language majors here. So why not? We got some artsies. So go ahead, Emily. Well, I can't, I can't help but notice you wrote both my major and my minor, both as bullshit degrees um i just realized though at at this university that you're talking about in new brunswick you can take um a five-year education degree and become a teacher you can't do that in ontario you have to do a degree in a subject and then you study education so had i studied in new brunswick i probably just would have been in education in which you classified 12 of the programs as good and eight is BS. So and and I was being very generous. Like a lot of me wanted to put all of education as bullshit because babysitting, but you do need some oh, teachers. Oh wow! <laughs> wow! Yeah, That's shots fired for for. I, I love how this is. Uh, and guys, this take this as gospel. Like this is as scientific <laughs> and, and fact driven as. I mean, I would never ever classify a teaching degree as bullshit because it has a clear path to a job. Which is why yeah. I put it as good because you still do need a certain amount of teachers. Oh, well, my, always prob- need teachers. my problem is the supply and demand. Like is, when when you're true. graduating 80 teachers every single year in New Brunswick from one university, you don't have 80 teachers retiring every single year. Oh, for you know, sure. So I, I think prob- uh, programs like that in education, you need to have them. Absolutely. 
but what you need to have is restricted class sizes and you need to have them based on the, the demand or the upcoming demand. Yes, so you, they need you, to, to cap how many people enter the program and also just by subject too. Like in, in Ontario where you, you enter a specific stream for your subject. I mean, I chose French as a second language because that's in high demand in Ontario. I got a permanent job my first year out of teacher's college. Yet, if you studied history and English, you might be six years after you graduate and you don't have a permanent or, job. Exactly. And, and if you get a job, you might not be practicing what you actually studied. Yeah. Right. Which, so, which is sad if that's what you're good at, you know? And I think there's room for pretty much every single program. But at the end of the day, it's how much room is there? So you, your person taking pottery, does that person really going to get like their money's worth out of their degree? So let, let's hit the arts. Let's have some fun with that. So I put let's poo poo on the arts. Yeah, because well, they probably can't even afford the poo poo. So you know, let's let's give it to them. Um, so I mean, I you're talking to two two of them here, yeah, <laughs> who are now happily employed. You know, exactly. I, hey, I don't know what I'm going to eat later today, but <laughs> but it's most likely going to be expensive. <laughs> no. So I put a couple of good degrees begrudgingly i put the jd map which is the masters in public administration the map maîtrise en administration publique yeah mpa yeah yeah so i put it begrudgingly there as a good degree because it's attached to a law degree and chances are you're going to get employed but the same thing as the the education degree i think you need a cap on lawyers because if you're graduating 50 lawyers every year like you don't need 50 uh, common law, French speaking lawyers in New Brunswick each and every single year. Like you're going to hit your your cap real quick there. And I think having caps on everything or almost everything, um, even if they're not like too stringent, if having caps also keeps everything competitive and fresh, right? So, so how so the you hell take the best? You 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 get the best. Uh, it's just like trying to get into this school rather than that school. They have different standards. They accept those people. Therefore, you get better students for what you're trying to achieve with them. And I get what they're doing here. They're protecting salaries. But explain me this one. How in the world is there a hard cap on the amount of med school students that will be admitted each and every single year, but we don't have a cap on English majors? Yeah, I yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Well, I, I know what I, it is. I, I think about it's this. to keep it competitive because they care about being competitive when it comes to medicine, but not so much with English because... Will well, people with English just, majors be saving your life? And, no. And you can get into the whole cultural relativism of, of things where you're like, you know, every job is the same and it's just as important the next, and the, as the next one. And you're like, yeah, but they're still like capping medicine, even though it's in super high demand and we're importing people in medicine. Uh, but, but yeah, there are no caps on English majors. Whatever. So here's why I put languages essentially as bullshit. You had 12 years in school. If you're not good in English and French, what the hell was were the teachers doing for 12 years? Because it's a base, it's a base competency. Like you should graduate high school and be competent in whatever language you're being taught. So yeah, why why do you book. have to because it's not really a skill. It, it's a skill, it's necessary, but you had 12 years to teach it. Why do you have to take another four years to now get good at it? You should be taking those four years or two years or whatever your degree may be to learn something actually applicable. And th there's not a whole lot of German factories. And I don't mean like like uh, Audi or Mercedes or something like that. I mean factories of the Germanic language. So it's it's useless. It, it's just plain useless. And if you were to learn German as an aside, okay. Or here's another thing. You can just learn it online. If, you, if you're going to work in a company that, that deals internationally and happens to deal in you know, auto manufacturing, well, okay, you'll probably just take it as like an evening course eventually once you're already an engineer who happens to also deal in Germany. You, you have no, no need for a four-year German program. So bulletproof, Jason. That was... <laughs> now, what, what I'll say, though, I'll play devil's advocate here is that Yes. However, there are uh, definitely some some tangible jobs that are necessary. Uh, yes, they're probably a lot uh, rarer than the amount of people we pump out of, you know, German language studies, uh, for instance. But you do need German translators, right? You do you do need folks that 
can uh, can can translate documents. You do need people who do instantaneous translation, all that kind of stuff. Um, so there's always requirements that are that can be categorized into hard skills, essentially, or you know, uh, true professions. Uh, but but yes, I see what you're saying. And also, I did put translation in the good degrees of the arts. There you go. Yeah. So it just translation. Means you know the language before you can study the translation, right? Well, here's the thing. If uh, my old boss and my old job, she has her degree in translation and learning the language was part of the translation degree. So it's not a separate degree and then translation. If you're doing a degree in translation, you're automatically specifying in English, French, mandatory, and one other language, usually either Spanish or German. And that's only one university, right? I assume larger universities have vaster you know, language specializations but automatically you're coming out of that degree with three language competencies and the ability to translate both oral and, and written. So that degree does come out with skills and a More third applicable. language. Mm. But if you're just taking the German degree, well, okay. I mean, I went to Germany. You know what I did to learn how to, how to speak German? Every Good single fear. person that I, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but every time I went somewhere, so I was like, hey, how do you say this? And they taught me the word. And then, like, I just made friends and learned a language and got drunk. There you go. Yeah. Um, so we'll we'll uh, we'll move along here. Uh, but uh, what I'll say is, if anybody listening to this is uh, is triggered or has their feelings hurt by Jason, then uh, find your space the, space on campus. Yeah, you're not the only one. Don't Don't, go to your puppy room. Go to your puppy room <laughs> on campus. Man, uh, I, I have a dog, so room. I'll go. I'll go snuggle with him later and be like, Jason was so mean to me. Uh, but uh, just don't worry about it, guys. Like I, I remember when we got to campus, um, uh, different faculties were chanting against other faculties. Uh, <laughs> and it was always these kinds of arguments, right? The chants were like, you won't get laid. And then the other argument was, uh, you won't get paid, you, you know, cause you're from the arts and things like that. So, um, just, just don't take, uh, everything so personally if, if you're doing something, that Jason uh, doesn't approve of. <laughs> I like how you're making me the boogeyman here. But hey, someone has to I be, mean, right? You started the BS scale. So. But if All right, you want let's... to personally yell at Jason, you can at him on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Wait, Thought, uh, Thought Crimes doesn't have Twitter, though, eh? No, we don't. No, we're not. All right, so at us at Instagram and Facebook and Locals. Yeah, Thought we'll Crimes. Yell at us there. Or, just, or just email us. Email Jason personally. <laughs> So he lives general, at ABC. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to move on to the last section of the podcast here, and these are general conversations. I uh, general questions. I want to start a, a conversation here. So I, I, I wrote down a few questions. I'll be kind of the your 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 MC here. Uh, so we'll start with the first one: Is do we push too many kids to go to university? Pick and me, uh, Emily, me. yeah, sure, Emily, raise your hand. <laughs> uh, speaking as a as a high school teacher yes the we we promote university much more than college generally and it kind of feels like by default we expect that you will continue to take the university route so you're taking academic classes like academic level classes uh which is what you need to get to university and only when students are struggling in in those levels of classes do we then seem to promote college as an alternative route. Um, I feel like that has been the case for years and years and years. Um, at my current school, I do feel like there is a little bit of a shift where we are trying to encourage okay. college uh, and saying like, college is pretty cool. Like go visit your local community college. Yeah, They have some sick like classrooms and equipment and programs. Um, but yeah, generally, university seems to be the default in a lot of students' minds. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, which, which again, I find goes back to what uh, we were highlighting at the beginning, which it goes against how our, our you know, free market system should be working, uh, where even from high school, we're pushing all like it's, it's like we don't care what our society looks like or needs right now. We're just like, yeah, all of you guys should go to university. Uh, just because you, you know, you score a certain amount in, in high school. Uh, and, and that's another thing I don't like is it's kind of like, oh, the smarter kids, you should all go to university. Yeah, and that's and, not uh, the case at all. 
No, it's, it's often not the case. And again, to me, there's also very different types of intelligence. Uh, and, and we only seem to value one in high school uh, and, and think that the way to go is university when we're not pushing people to become like, I don't know, uh, amazing plumbers. Uh, amazing um, coders. You don't. You don't need to go to university to become a like really good, high-paid coder who can, you know, write up the next Facebook code. Like, it's not. That's not how it works. And and I just feel like none of that is being valued or even looked at in high school. No, and I, I think we don't share enough just how cool it is if you go into the trades that you are doing something tangible. Like most trades, you You're are building literally building something i mean we drive by construction sites and sometimes i'll be like man i wish i was a carpenter (laughs) like you can they build stuff that's so cool and and think how much you're saving when you can troubleshoot and fix problems in your own home if you're a plumber or an electrician instead of spending you know 150 dollars an hour on service and then parts on top of that well you just go and buy the materials and do it yourself you're you're essentially cutting out two-thirds of the cost and lowering the response time to zero. And and uh, another financial argument is you're maybe doing your degree, like your your college skill uh, for two years. Uh, and if that, because you're working, right? You're working, on, if, if you're not working for yourself yet, you're working under someone or for a company uh, in, a, in a sort of practicum or skills development thing to you know become a master carpenter or whatever it may be. And you're making money not only are you doing something tangible, you're making money while you're not spending it on an insanely expensive four years. And, and one thing that we haven't touched on is, is the admission criteria to get into university before every small town had their, their own university. And we spoke a lot on that will with, in our podcast on uh, the cycle of empire, when you only had the few higher education buildings, like the Oxfords and the, the Harvards of the world, well, it was only the best of the best that could get in. But now, essentially, you only need a pulse and a number two pencil, and you can get into university, almost irrespective of the program. So, uh, of course, you're going to flood the market with degrees. And, of course, your your degree is going to be essentially worthless when the, the barrier to entry to get even into those degrees is essentially zero. So, I, I, think, uh, I think we covered the next question, too, is do we do a good job of showing kids all available options after high school? We kind of touched on that as... I don't think so. Not at all. Uh, I, I look back at my time in high school and uh, they did a horrible job. It, it was kind of like you're a kid, you're biased because you think you want to do a certain thing. I wanted to be an engineer for the longest time. And I was I was good in school. I was good in the sciences. So it was like, yeah, you should be an engineer. And it, it was never kind of like, OK, uh, why? Uh, what do you like to do? What do you find valuable? Uh, did you know that college offers all of these cool things? If you like engineering, you could, you know, you, have you thought of architecture? Have you th- thought of plumbing? Like whatever it may be, there's never any of that. It's always like, OK, what? Yeah. What What are you going to do at university? Um, and, and not even college. They don't even show you what is needed in the workforce right now. That's another thing, too. And I, I feel like there's this uh, this thing that most high schoolers assume is that if you go to college, your job will pay less. Like you won't be able to get a high paying job. And that's just so far from the truth. You know, yeah. you, in the trades, generally you have, to, you have to work hard to make good money. But if you have that work ethic, you can make great money. And you can also, you know, become a head of your team or start your own business in that trade and, you know, make so much money. Um, and you're not spending years paying off all of and the what's, debt you. Okay. What often comes with those jo- those types of jobs and skills too is you can work as much as you want, right? Mm-hmm. So like if you're a plumber, for instance, I'm thinking of our buddy, he can choose certain weeks to work a shit ton of hours, but with those hours come more pay, uh, right? And more productivity. Uh, whereas with many degrees at university, that's just not how your outcome job will look like. Uh, it's not a work for yourself type job. And one thing that pretty much this entire discussion has revolved around being an employee, but never being an employer. And we just now start to touch on entrepreneurship. And that's one thing that schools almost by definition cannot teach because anyone who has become a teacher essentially went from high school to university to being a teacher. So you have 
like zero qualification to teach entrepreneurship because you can't know the basis of it because you've never been exposed to it. When entrepreneurship is the backbone of society, that in the, the family unit, essentially. And I, I know I'm drawing hard, hard conclusions here, but if you want to generalize, that's what it is. And anyone who's going to start a business, anyone who's going to develop, say that we're using the example of the plumber, is going to create jobs, is going to create more prosperity, is going to create a greater tax basin for the prov- for their province, for their state, for their country, and is also going to employ other people. Now, of course, you can't really teach a, a high school student, go be a business owner, but you can teach them the concepts and you can plant the seed that when they do gain the, those hard skills, now they can actually grow and develop. But if you throw someone into business administration, chances are good they're just going to work in a cubicle for the rest of their life. Yeah, fair. All right, next question. The wokeness of universities. Is it a problem? Well, this one's yours. Have fun. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, I think I answered that question earlier when I talked. Yeah, about, I was going to uh, say you did touch on it. Uh, indoctrination. Interestingly, though, I was talking about this with my boyfriend who studied engineering, and uh, he was saying how, f- for his program at least, he really didn't feel any of this woke wokeness in his program. Um, he said if it oh, did, like he didn't realize it, <laughs> and I'd say even from the. 10 years ago when we start, well, when I started university till now, I'd say things have gotten more woke than even when we were in university, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and I think at the end of the day, even if you take away the more of those, those hard sciences, like engineering, math, biology, whatever, even if you say, oh, it hasn't affected those. And it, yes, it has now, but let's, let's just for the sake of the argument. And you look at more of the humanities and the arts and things like that. The universities still don't do what they were built and designed to do with those degrees as well, which was, which was truly to, you know, to learn to think for yourself, uh, to learn how to conduct correct and, you know, minutious research and, and, and greater thinking, um, uh, and, and then being able to communicate, write, write your findings, you know, share that with the world. But, but at the end of the day, it was all about challenging all ideas, including your own. And that's just not something that is taught in the humanities or the social sciences, which is essentially what universities were all the way back to the, to the Greeks. Right. Uh, so, so that's just, um, it's a shame really. And, uh, just a quick stat here, uh, or a couple. So in Canada, the top 40 universities in the arts, humanities, social sciences, uh, 73% of profs now identify as either left leaning or, or leftist versus 4% identify as conservative. So that's a stat from uh, Eric, his prof, uh, political prof, I, I think, Eric Kaufman. And also think how far the Overton window has shifted to the left. So for one to identify as left, that's already within an Overton window that is to the left. Right. Um, is, are we assuming the other 20% says they're like new, more centrist? They could centrist or, or uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I didn't see the other options. But essentially, they took, they, they, they took both the left and the right gotcha. and asked, how do you identify? So it's, it's uh, 73% versus 4%. Uh, and another crazy stat that's even much crazier, this is in the US, and this is from a stat from Gad Saad uh, in the Parasitic Mind book I just read. Uh, some disciplines have a ratio of 44 to 1 when it comes to uh, identifying more as left-leaning versus right-leaning or conservative. So the this 44 to 1 ratio, I believe, is from sociology, is, is uh, the discipline he looked at for that. Uh, so again, you can say what you want, but there is a bias, just period. I'm, um, I'm, I'm picturing that poor, like, one conservative prof sitting in the lunchroom. <laughs> yeah. Trying to find friends. Haven't, haven't, hasn't been allowed or felt like he, he's, able, he's able to say anything in the last, you know, 10 years. Okay. Um, very quickly here. If choosing university, what programs would you actually choose real quick? Rapid fire. So just to piss Jason off, I'm going to say I would probably choose the exact same program I first cho- chose, um, which is only because I've wanted to be a teacher and that was the clear path to get there. So pick two topic or pick two subjects that are teachable, study them and then do teacher's college. So I'd probably do that. Or um, translation, because I do love languages, and translation is a very 
useful degree. We need translators everywhere. So I'm sure I would also have a job if I were a translator. Cool. Jason? Using Mayo, I'll, I'll use kind of the, the same framework as Emily. Using Mayo and interest, if I had to redo university, I would do biochemistry or accounting. Biochemistry in and of itself is not very useful, but it opens the, the door to medicine, to pharmacy, to laboratory sciences, that sort of thing. Laboratory. Mm. Wow. You're fancy. I, I big, would, words. Uh, yeah, big word for, for Jason. Uh, I would not necessarily what I would do, but I would like what I would suggest is things like um, nursing. I think nursing is a great example of, of, of a good, solid university degree that will pretty much absolutely get you a job. Uh, and last thing. Do we teach the right things? And I'm talking more about high school. So kind of when you're deciding what to do with your life. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying uh, this is not the same question as earlier where we say, you know, do we do we lean too much towards university for high school kids is what do we teach? Uh, what classes or subjects that we don't teach in high school that we should be teaching? Uh, the, the big one for me, and I'll, I'll let you guys add is we don't teach enough about basic economics. That's a very big one for me. We don't teach uh, high school students what are taxes, why we have taxes, why they matter, uh, how to do taxes. We don't teach people basically how the free market works, uh, what are stocks, shares, dividends, all of those kinds of things that if you knew coming out of high school, I just I could I can guarantee that our population in general would be a much richer society because of it. Like so many people kind of figure out how to invest and what, how to really make their money work maybe by 30. And uh, you've already lost a good 10 years of your life to, to be able to make a dent in your retirement funds or, or lifelong investments. And that's, so. a, and that's assuming you don't have student loans and you can actually, you know, afford to, to pay into investments. Yeah. Anything else guys? Uh, uh, yeah. Mine would I... have been the same financial literacy. Okay. Mine is uh, to encourage more students. I mean, a lot of high schools already offer mechanics and shop classes, but I really wish we encouraged more students to take them. Um, yeah. Again, it seems like this, the students who take those classes, um, a lot of the times it's only boys uh, who are already planning on going into a trade. Whereas I wish I'd taken a mechanics class. You know, I own a you, car now and I'd like to understand how it works, yeah. but I don't I took, for the most part. I took a, I took shop class and uh, I mean, I, you know, we had my, our dad's shed. So I worked, I did some woodworking growing up a little bit, but uh, it helped a little bit, right? Working more with my hands in yeah, class. Sure. And uh, now I, woodworking is kind of a side thing I do. I, I quite enjoy it. Yeah. And I would say you could have like one mandatory, um, say mechanics class where you'd learn how to change an oil, how to change a lock on a door how to change a sink, how to change a toilet, like things like that, right? That you're most likely going to meet in yeah. your- How to change your, a tire for a lot of people. Yeah, how to change a tire. Uh, all these things like, you know, how to use a, a carpenter square, just just kind of stuff like that. And what that's also going to do is going to be a little bit of auto mechanics, a little bit of carpentry, a little bit of plumbing. So it'd be like, oh, that was kind of cool. Maybe, maybe now I'll consider plumbing, or at least it'll plant that seed. Yeah, exactly. Then you're exposed to it. So any final thoughts, guys, before we wrap it up? No, yeah, I think we're I think we're uh, over time here, so uh, I think we'll leave it at that. Yeah, so hopefully, I don't know if this uh, this clarifies anything for anyone. Maybe it wasn't necessarily meant to clarify anything, but it's really uh, we're here to have an open discussion about about university, what we think about it today, and uh, and uh, that we should probably the conclusion is we should be teaching our high school kids, um, or at, at least showing them that there's uh, many, many opportunities and it doesn't always have to uh, lean towards university. So thanks a lot. If you have any questions or want us to touch on a topic next time, uh, leave us uh, an email or yeah, uh, join us on Instagram or uh, Locals. Thought Crimes Podcast is the name and you can also find our podcast wherever uh, podcasts are found. So Spotify, Apple Podcasts and, uh, and even YouTube. So cheers, guys. Thanks for having me. See ya.